we have in our guest speakers today, Sean and Shannon Blankenship, and they have been spent the last year in Aruba, and here they're here to catch us up with what's been happening in their life and the next phase, the next season that God's taken them. So help me give them a big MMC welcome and welcome them to the stage today. Thank, thank you, Jacob. Let me just say something about Jacob. He is the only youth pastor on the planet who is already counting down to summer camp next year. I'm telling you, my daughter was a, was a youth pastor for, for five or six years, and this was the week that she uh, hibernated <laughs> and uh, got away from things because uh, it's stressful, and God bless you guys for what you do because summer camp is, uh, is a great, great ministry. Uh, I got I to gotta share something real quick. Um, uh, y'all ever have random thoughts at just really crazy times? Um, we're singing that song, He's a Good, Good Father, and, uh, uh, and all I could think about was the perfect country and western song. Um, some of y'all know what I'm talking about, right? Because you've been in a bar and they play it every night. So, um, But then the Holy Spirit said, this is the perfect worship song. Because it identifies who God is, and it identifies who I am, very simply. It doesn't complicate it. I'm a real simple guy. Like the Bible, you know, I've got college degrees and all sorts of things. I've been to Bible school, and I've been in ministry for, for way too long, and, and uh, uh, I've been in debates theologically and all that. And then, and then go ahead and throw that first slide up there, and then um, the Bible just comes down to relationship, and that's it. There's nothing more. If you're not talking about relationship to me when we're talking scripture, I'm really probably not interested in the conversation um, because then you get into arguments and fights and stuff, and it's just about relationship. That's it. From beginning to end, read the book. You'll find out. But, uh, and it, it just tells me who I am. I'm loved by God. You want to know who I am? That's who I am. I'm loved by God. That says volumes. You could speak about that forever. My wife, Shannon, is sitting over there. She's given me the platform this morning because um, my mouth's just too big, and uh, I got too much to share. And, and my lovely kids, Grayson and Carson, uh, are here also. So, uh, yes, we spent the last year in Aruba. Um, no, we weren't on the beach the whole time, but I have plenty of pictures to prove that. I did go to the beach, but you're not going to see those this morning. Um, we're going to talk about what's taking place in Aruba, what Shannon and I are going to do moving forward, and our kids and, uh, and I want to share a word with you real quickly. Um, addiction uh, is rampant. Y'all realize that, right? You've seen the news. Uh, heroin addiction, deaths by uh, opioid overdose, both street drugs and prescription drugs and all that. It's in the news every single day. Every single day. I think, I think last year there was $34 billion spent on uh, drug addiction treatment by the government alone uh, last year. It is a big, big issue. And... Uh, uh, addiction is like that all around the world. Uh, several years ago, uh, a stat came out by the World Health Organization that 250 million people were addicted. Um, new statistics out of, out of India say there's, there's uh, 400 million people in India addicted alone. And in China, there's, there's uh, that many or more. So, the statistics are, are just mind, mind-boggling. The world of the addict is filled with hopelessness. Um, I said by the end of this slideshow in there, but in reality, because the, I planned the slideshow to just run straight through, in reality, um, seven addicts will die every minute. Since I've been up here, about 14 addicts have, have passed away. Before you leave church today, from the moment church started to the moment church ends, 360 addicts around the world will die of addiction directly. Before the end of this year, more than the population of Oklahoma will have died in 2018 from addiction. Wrap your mind around that. Wrap your mind around that. It's mind-boggling. Next year, it'll be worse. The, this, the, this, this issue of hopelessness leading to death through addiction is, is taking over this world. But there is a hope there is a hope that, that can overcome that and can save that addicted person out of that. Shannon and I spent the last year in Aruba taking hope to the addicted on the streets of Aruba. Uh, Aruba is 
uh, the third highest per capita rate of alcohol addiction on the planet. Um, it's an island that's one-seventh the size of Delaware County in, geogra- in geography and, and three times the size of Delaware County in uh, population, about 120,000 people. And uh, of that entire population, every man, woman, and child, more than 50% of them have a problem with alcohol and or drug use. Wrap your head around that because a big chunk of those are kids. Um, it knows no age. First slide, please, or second slide. Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. Next slide. Hope is where it's at. Rancho City, taking it to the streets. This area right here, just to the right, we'll see a picture of what's just to uh, the right of that in a minute. It's a, it's a drug house, but Rancho City is literally a stone's throw from the cruise ship shopping area. Anybody here ever been to Aruba on a cruise? Um, you probably you may know somebody who has. If, if they go on a cruise, they'll park their ship, they'll get off their ship, and they're within, they're within yards of this place right here. Um, it's a th- this part is a third world country. Next slide. There's my wife and, and the director of Freedom House Teen Challenge, Women's Teen Challenge Program in Shakota, Oklahoma. They're ministering to a young lady. There are no treatment programs of any kind, outpatient or inpatient or residential, for addicted women in the nation of Aruba. If you're a woman and you're addicted, you don't have a place to go. Every day that we would go into this area, women would say, when are you opening a women's home? When are you opening a women's home? When they found out the home we were opening wasn't women, they were distraught. They wept. Um, next slide, please. Praying there in, the, in that area, in that same area. If you see the, the outhouse behind there, that's not a porta potty. That's a shower, a porta potty that was turned into a shower. This church has been doing this for about 17 years every Saturday, um, giving the homeless a shower, cutting their hair, washing their feet if they didn't want a shower, feeding them, um, all sorts of things. And there we are praying with a young man. Next slide. The face of hopelessness. I called this, I called this man Dino earlier. There is a Dino. His name is actually Gino. Um, and, uh, but that's Gino, the face of hopelessness. Next slide, please. It's praying with a, with a young man homeless and addicted on the streets of a, of a town called St. Nicholas, which is rampant with drugs, uh, prostitution, gangs. Next slide, please. It's the red light district in Aruba. This is the area they don't like to talk about. Prostitution is legal in this area. It's not legal on the north side of the island. It is illegal in this city. Those ladies you see there are trafficked there from other countries. They have no choice. They're hopeless. Um, And we're doing outreach there uh, on a Friday night. Next slide, please. That's a drug house. If you want to know what a crack house looks like, that's a crack house in Aruba in a Caribbean country. Yes, that's a bunch of Christian women standing in front of it, posing for a picture. Next slide, please. How many of you know that even a crack house needs a coat of paint? Yeah, we took a group of ladies, went into the home of a lady named Astrid. She's in a wheelchair. She doesn't have a choice whether or not her house is a crack house. Her grandchildren and her daughter sell crack. I had a picture of her daughter. Her daughter sits in the outside of the front of that door, sitting in a lawn chair selling crack to people that come by, tourists that walk in things like that. Largest crack house in Aruba. We ministered to them through that. That's Gino, the face of hopelessness, smashing his crack pipe with a rock. He wasn't asked to do it. He pulled it out of that backpack as I picked him up off the street on a Saturday afternoon to bring him into treatment, pulled his crack pipe out, grabbed a rock, smashed it, cried out to the skies with his hands raised up that he wanted freedom. Next slide, please. That's sharing in the schools there in Aruba. Addiction among, among the youth there is bigger than it is in the United States. That's uh, some of the students there who completed their first discipleship class. There's 14 group discipleship classes that they go through through Teen Challenge, and they just completed it. How many of you all feel better when you, when you accomplish things? Yeah, men, you love it when you finish mowing the grass, don't you? Feels good. That's a team out of Memphis, Tennessee, a teen challenge program of men who came and shared the gospel and hope in, in 
the form of uh, a dramatic presentation, a human video, to uh, uh, rehab, another rehab there in Aruba. Next slide. Hurricane relief, when the hurricanes came through, um, we weren't anywhere near them. Aruba is amazingly protected from hurricanes. Uh, but we were gathering get together uh, donations to send to St. Martin. Uh, next slide. That's my son, Grayson. Um, God gave him a word. I put this up here just to encourage you young people and those of you who don't think that you can be used or that you could ever be up here on this stage. Uh, that man, if I asked him to come up here right now, he would absolutely say no way. He doesn't enjoy the spotlight, but God gave him a word that day, and he shared it just impromptu with the church, and, and it really, really impacted people. That's the, first, that's the day we opened Casa Speranza. Hope now has an address in Aruba. It's uh, Alta Vista 52. If you're ever in Aruba, you can drive by there and, and visit the place. There's a farm there called Goshen. If you're into organic vegetables, we have a farm there where we raise uh, all sorts of things, bonchi and concumbers and uh, yambo. That's green beans. Uh, cucumbers and uh, okra. Uh, we introduced them also to fried okra. Had to do that. Uh, they boiled it. So. Um, that's the first night with our students. That's my wife praying with them. That was our first three students on the very first night, July 17th of 2017. Next slide. That's our indoor classroom when we finally got uh, an indoor classroom. Uh, for our discipleship, and the, the guy teaching is an intern that spent six months with us. Anybody interested in going to Aruba for a couple of months to help out, free place to stay, free food, we can hook you up. Just get a plane ticket, and you're taken care of. Uh, you can go spend 30 days in Aruba helping out. The guy on the, on the left there, that's the face of hopelessness, but not anymore. That's Gino, and uh, on the left there is his brother, or on the right there, is his brother, Ferdy. They hadn't seen each other in a year and a half, both of them drug addicts, their entire adult life. Gino was in the program, and Ferdy was picked up off the streets by Raphael there in the middle that day and brought to the program, not knowing anything. And they reunited there in the program, an amazing day. They're on the front porch of Casa Pronto. Next slide. There's uh, the morning devotions, where the guys are reading their word and sharing together about what God's doing in their life. Prison minute... Uh, the picture. Did. Next slide. There we go. That's uh, a, gr a group of men from Memphis going into the prison. If you're 12 years old or you're 92 years old, that's where you go to prison. That's where you go to jail. So um, don't break the law in Aruba or that's where you go to jail. That's the women's prison right there um, on the same grounds. And that's the women's program from Oklahoma about to go in there and minister to the ladies who are locked up there taking hope into the prison. And that's what hope looks like. That's Ferdy, Francisco, and Dino. Dino there on the left is going to be the first graduate of the program uh, four weeks from today. And, uh, yeah, very excited. He spent, he spent seven years in prison for attempted murder. And now, um, two months from now, he'll be a staff member at Teen Challenge, bringing hope to other men in Aruba. Go ahead and put the, that slide up there. Let me, let me just share quickly um, before I, I get into uh, the message I want to share with you. Shannon and I um, worked here in Delaware County for 12 years with New Life Girls Home that's over by the amphitheater and the Boys Ranch, Brush Creek Youth Ranch, and Jay for 12 years. They're both teen challenge programs, and, and God had us leave. We went on the field to Aruba to start a men's program in Aruba, and now Global Teen Challenge who's the largest organization of addiction treatment centers in the world. Um, we have uh, about 1,300 programs in 100, about 140 countries around the world. There's more than 20,000 men, women, and children in addiction treatment around the globe. Shannon and I will be moving to Columbus, Georgia, uh, to base out of there, out of the international headquarters of Global Teen Challenge. Um, and it's because... Um, God wants to reach every addict in the world. Our tagline is putting hope within reach of every addict. Put hope within reach of every addict. And the first time I heard that, I thought, that's crazy. You can't do it. And then I realized that's a God idea. 
It's not my idea, and it can be done. And Shannon and I are blessed to be a part of that. What we were able to accomplish in Aruba and what we're going to be doing in the future is uh, partly it's because of, of you guys are involved in that, and you may not even know that. It's support of people like you, churches like this, uh, our friends, our families, our neighbors who support us as missionaries who allow us to go and do this because there's not a paycheck in it. Um, this is, this is missions ministry. Um, Shannon and I, Shannon's actually leading a missions team from here in Delaware County from the teen challenge programs to Rwanda in November for two weeks and, uh, taking hope to the streets of Rwanda. But, um, that's what we're going to be doing on a larger scale. We've just focused in Aruba. Now we're actually going to be helping hands on with, with, uh, centers around the world, helping other directors to train them and to raise them up and to, to help them with resources so that they can put hope within reach of every addict on the planet. We have teen challenge programs in China. Shh, they don't want us to say that. Um, but, but we do, we have teen challenge outreaches there. We have teen challenge outreaches in, in, in countries all over the world. Um, we're reaching people with the hope of Jesus Christ. I want to share with you a word here uh, the next few minutes. Uh, this scripture, I thought I was going to go a different way uh, because Shannon and I are your Delaware County local hope dealers. And uh, we are, um, uh, I, th- I thought I was going to speak about hope this morning but I want to speak about, I, w- I woke up this morning and the first word that, that came to mind, the Holy Spirit said, speak joy. Tell them about joy and what it is because uh, hope is what leads to the joy of the Lord. This scripture says, I pray that God, the source of hope, will find you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him. Then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. And that hope is what we pour out. It's what flows out of us because we have the joy of the Lord in our lives. You see, many times we, we came from an island where their, their Aruba calls themselves one happy island. That's their tagline, the happy island. And I tell you this morning that I'm not looking for happiness anymore. I don't want happiness in my life. Oh, I, I, I'll accept it when it's come, but it, no, don't, let, me, let me rephrase that. It's not that I don't want happiness. I'm not seeking happiness anymore. Things that make me happy happen. Some things make me happy without me, uh, without me doing anything. My grandchild, my fourth grandchild was born a few weeks ago. I was happy. In fact, there's video of me doing a, a double Russian toe touch like this. I can do it, yes. I turned 53 years old today. Happy birthday, Stacy, my birthday partner. But, um, so I was happy. I was so happy that I jumped up and touched my toes and all that stuff right there in the delivery room. Um, so things make me happy. Just I had nothing to do with, with that child being born except, you know, bringing my daughter into the world. Uh, she brought her into the world. I helped. I but there's a big difference between happiness and joy. See, I can be happy standing on, the, standing on the, the edge of the Grand Canyon and looking out over that and experiencing that. I can be happy. I can be happy at, at the Cadillac Ranch in Amarillo where you just get to spray paint on the Cadillacs that are stuck in the ground. Uh, I, I, I was happy there. I can be happy um, on the beach in Aruba. I was happy every time I was there snorkeling, sunset, you know, sunset sails, um, you know, uh, swimming in a beautiful ocean, I've been at the base of volcanoes where the gorillas are. I've, I've spoken to world leaders. I've been invited to the United Nations. I've uh, preached in Mayan churches that were a third this size with 80 people in them. Um, that was the biggest honor of my life. Uh, and I've preached in churches in Bujumbura, uh, Burundi with 4,000 people. I've preached in refugee camps in southern Rwanda with thousands of people. I've done a lot of things that bring happiness in my life and make me feel good about those things. Um, And I don't tell you those to pat myself on the back, and that's where I'm at, because I was at a place in my life at one point where if you knew everything, you'd wonder how in the world 
is this guy even allowed on the stage? How in the world is this guy allowed to do the things he's done? Why does he get to do those things? Because, see, my life seems blessed. My life seems like God's favor is just on me and everything goes right. And, and I've had people um, here in Delaware County tell me, you don't have problems. You got everything going great for you. I've had people tell my kids that. Other kids tell my kids that. You don't understand. If you could see into the depths of my family, you would realize that we're no different than you. And in many ways, our lives are, are tougher than a lot. Not as tough as some, tougher than others. We've been through some things. But it's because of the joy of the Lord that I stand before you today. It's because I've come to understand what the joy of the Lord is and that I, that I cannot live in happiness. I cannot live looking to put happiness in my life, that I must maintain and sustain myself in the joy of the Lord. Because the Scripture says that's what comes in the morning. It doesn't say happiness comes in the morning. It says joy comes in the morning. You see, the drug addict is looking for happiness. You see, in 1995 was the beginning of a time where I sought happiness through a Corona with Lyme. That's a beer for those of you who don't know. And a lot of them. You see, because on April 16th, Easter Sunday of 1995, we're sitting in church and the, my wife's water breaks. She's not far enough along for that. Two days later, she gave birth to my stillborn son, my first son, Zachariah Sean Blankenship. It's a tough moment in my life. Just a few weeks ago, that grandson that I told you was born, Otis Zachariah Blankenship, yeah, named after my firstborn son, was born directly across the hall from where Zachariah died. So just a matter of years later, in one room, I'm holding my grandson, and I'm doing this Russian toe touch, and uh, just happy as can be. But in the room across the hall, just a couple of decades prior, I was standing solemnly in the window looking down on uh, Utica Avenue in Tulsa, Oklahoma, while my wife slept from the narcotics she was on holding the body of my stillborn son. It's a big difference, but that was a moment in my life that was crazy powerful, powerful enough that it got my eyes off of God and on the things of the world and begin to walk me out uh, from under the joy of the Lord. See, the joy of the Lord never left, but I began to walk away from it. I began to look at other things, and it was a point in my life that, that I even forgot about the hope that brings the joy. That led to a couple of years of drinking every night, of leaving work and going to the bar instead of going home, and staying at the bar until it closed, hoping that there was an after party to go to, driving 25 miles home, drunk, so drunk I couldn't see straight, to a wife who was acting like she was asleep, leading me to do things that I never thought I could do, all because I had walked away from the joy of the Lord. It wasn't God's fault. I blamed God because that moment when I held my son in the same hospital where years before, when I was eight years old, I walked in to the lobby. I can take you to the place in the lobby of St. John's Hospital today where I was eight years old, and my uncle said, son, your dad has died. Took me back to that moment and all those emotions. I began to live in those emotions, and it's what caused me to make the choice to walk away and forget about the joy of the Lord 
and what it really means. See, I asked earlier today in the first service, do you really believe God's perfect like that song says? It says you're perfect in all of your ways. You're perfect in everything you do. Do you really believe that? You sing it. Do you really believe it? Because if you don't, in that moment when you're holding your son's body in your hand, you'll forget that he's perfect. Because even in that moment, I know now, 22 years later, that he was perfect right there in that room. He was there to comfort me and to guide me and direct me. And every step and every day and every decision I would make and every emotion I would have in those moments that I wanted to kill myself, he was still there. His perfect love and grace and mercy and counsel for me was still there. But I wouldn't listen. And it caused me to lose the joy of the Lord. And because I didn't have joy, when we don't have joy in our life, we must have happiness to survive. Because it's what gets us through the day. It's what the drug addict is seeking. The drug addict is trying to fill the hole in their life because they don't have joy. And they're happy for a moment. But I'm yet to talk to a drug addict who would wake up every morning thinking, this is going to be a great day. No, their first thought is, where am I going to get my drugs? How am I going to pay for it? In other words, where am I going to get my happiness from today? A couple of years later, this was one bookend in a season of my life. The other bookend was when I stood on the corner of 21st and Sheridan in the parking lot of a 7-Eleven where the old Bowman Twin Theater used to be. I think it's laser tag now. I can take you to that spot too. Where placed in this hand was a piece of paper that on the top of it said, in the matter of divorce, Shannon Blankenship versus Sean Blankenship. She's still my first wife, by the way. It was at that moment just as powerfully as this moment, it was at that moment when I understand, when I understood and I came to the realization I didn't have the joy of the Lord any longer. And that's what I was missing. It wasn't long after that when I went knocking back on her door because I wasn't living with her anymore because of the choices in my life. And I asked her if I could come back. And for some crazy, bizarro reason, she said yes. Still not living for the Lord, but just a few weeks later, I came back to the Lord. And I found that joy at an altar in a church in Skytook, Oklahoma, where I simply wept for 90 minutes. I cried the hurt out and the joy began to come back into my life. And it's because of that today, when, when, when I have those times when, I'm, when I feel like I've been kicked by a mule, when, when my face looks like Gino's, the face of hopelessness, when, when the world just seems to be caving in on me, that I can turn to my perfect father the one who defines who I am. That no matter what happens to me, no matter the choices I make, no matter the things that go on in my life, my father looks down on me and says, I love you. I love you. I love you, son. Because that's who I am. And I live in the joy that comes from the source of hope. Do you need joy in your life today? Do you need to to plug in to the source of hope? You see, that we all go through times in our life of hopelessness. If I ask you to raise your hands, many of you wouldn't 
because you just wouldn't. I don't have to ask you that. There's not a person here except for that little guy right there. He's the exception. Who hasn't felt hopeless? Who hasn't felt like nothing will go right? Where am I going to go tomorrow? There are a large number of people in this room who have thought about not being here anymore. Some of them much, much younger than me. And some of them, yes, even a little older than this guy. You've been there. But there is a source of hope that brings joy through every situation. That even in the depths of darkness, even in the den of lions, even before you're being thrown in the fiery furnace, you still understand he'll save me, but if he doesn't, he's still God. The source of hope, the creator of all joy in my life, and the one who defines who I am. As I close this morning, I just want to ask you, do you need hope today? But more importantly, do you need joy? Are you tired of happiness coming and going? Are you tired of being happy one day and sad the next because it just didn't go as well as the day before? Are you tired of being afraid of Monday mornings because, oh no, it's another week. I love Mondays. Because of the joy of the Lord. This morning with every every eye closed, every head bowed, honor just this moment for really just a minute. This morning, if if you don't know that source of the source of joy, If you don't, the source of hope who brings joy, if you don't know him, this morning you have that opportunity, whether you're at home watching this or you're right here in this sanctuary this morning in the presence of the Holy Spirit himself. This morning, very quickly, we're going to say a prayer as as, as a group because all of us need it in our life and all of us need to say this prayer on a regular basis or one like it. This morning, if you say, Brother Sean, Yes, I want to know Jesus, the source of hope, the bringer of joy. Would you just slip your hand up and write back down anyone this morning, just very quickly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just say this prayer. If all of us would just say this prayer together, honoring the moment. Heavenly Father, I love you today. Thank you for loving me enough to send your son, Jesus Christ, to die on a cross and shed his perfect blood to clean this imperfect life. This morning, I confess you as king. I ask you to be my friend, my brother, my Lord, and my Savior. Come into my heart this morning. I pledge to you today that each and every day, I'll follow you. I'll seek my hope and my joy through your ways and your direction in my life. I ask that you help me to walk that out every day. day. I give you all the glory and the praise. Thank you for loving me, for defining who I am, and for being a good, good father. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, guys. Are you thankful for hope, for joy, for peace? What a great message by Brother Sean. And uh, we're so privileged to have them to be a part of the MMC family. So excited about the things that are to come in their lives. And I want to encourage you guys to be praying for them. They've got a big transition ahead, a big move ahead, and they need God to, uh, to provide for them and protect them and bless them more than ever before. So how many of you guys would say, I'm going to commit to be praying for them from yeah. this point forward? Amen. Amen. Hey, if you get a chance uh, in between services, let them know how much you love them. Let them know you're praying for them today.
Amen. Hey, if you just made that decision to follow Christ and to have joy every day, we've got a gift for you. It's called our Next Step Kit. You can pick it up on the left as you exit. And if you're online and you made that decision, you prayed that prayer, just say all in in the comments and message us your address and we will mail one out to you in the morning. But guys, it has a Bible and a message from Brad and I on what you do next. Because a one-time prayer isn't enough, guys. It's every single day getting up and feeding yourself the Word of God and watching your life change right before your eyes. Will you put your hands together for those in this house today that just made that decision? Hey, thanks for joining us today. We sincerely hope the message impacted your life. Stay connected with us by following us online, or you can find us on Facebook. If you would like to partner with us financially, we have a few easy ways to give. You can text your giving to 77977 and simply type in MMC and follow the prompts. Or you could find us online at www.mountainmoverschurch.org and click the Give Now tab. Or you could simply mail your giving in to 24000 South 660 Road, Grove, Oklahoma 74344. We are a church leading people into a real and life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ that is contagious. We look forward to seeing you next week.